Hi, yeah, so I'm Scott Stoller from uh, Stony Brook University in New York, uh, part of the State University of New York uh, system. So the ideal person to have given this talk would actually be my colleague, Annie Liu, who I work with on this. Uh, but she is actually organizing one of the other flock workshops and so felt she <laughs> couldn't uh, tear herself away from it. Um, and this is also joint work with uh, three PhD students, uh, Saksham Chand, who has actually done the proofs with TLAPS, which I'll mention. And so I may not be able to answer very detailed questions about them, but I will do my best. And otherwise, I'll refer them to him <laughs> and get back to you. Uh, Xu Tian Wang, who has done so the experiments with uh, um, the model checker with TLC, uh, although we've mostly been using TLAPS. And Bo Lin is the, um, has implemented the distributed programming language that I will uh, talk to you about. So the, I have to say this talk is largely about our sort of application domain, which is distributed algorithms and how to write them and verify them. And I, I mean, not that much of it is really specific to TLA or TLAPS, but I hope at least you'll find these uh, applications interesting. In fact, we've already seen some distributed algorithms mentioned this morning. There was the, the uh, maximal independent set, and, and one of the benchmarks in the symbolic model checking was uh, Paxos. And I, I will also mention Paxos, and um, yeah. So, uh, I, will, I have quite a few slides, so I'll try to go through them quickly. So I apologize if it feels like I'm rushing, and you know, just slow me down if you have a question about anything that, that you're, you, you know, want me to explain more. So I, this is just general motivation about how important distributed algorithms are, and they're difficult to get right. So it's really uh, worthwhile to spend effort on, on different verification techniques. Um, uh, one, one of our focus uh, has been on developing better languages for writing distributed algorithms. And we want this language to both make it easier to, to write the algorithms, to understand them, um, to communicate them. That's like uh, Will mentioned this morning. We think uh, specs are, are, and proofs should be as readable as possible. And that's been one of our emphasis. It's not just on getting yes, it passed out, but having something other people can understand. Um, now, as far as writing the algorithms themselves, we, there's a sort of spectrum between uh, pseudocode languages, which are very sort of designed to be easy to read but are not executable. Programming languages, which are executable but not as readable. There's lots of details and, and stuff. And then something in the middle, specification languages. And we're trying, we tried to design a language that would be both higher level than, uh, at least for writing distributed algorithms, than, than existing languages and be executable and be convenient for verification. Right? And the, our language is called distalgo. Um, and I'm going to use uh, as a kind of uh, example for introducing it and the kind of things we're doing with distributed algorithms, I'll use the classic mutual exclusion algorithm from Lamport's you know, seminal 1978 paper on time clocks and ordering of events. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people are already familiar with that paper or the algorithm in it? All right. Oh, OK. Uh, uh, a whole bunch. So that is helpful. I will go through it anyway, um, but I'll, like I said, I'll try to go sort of quickly. So we, um, we did verification by. Uh, uh, our work on verification involves writing a formal semantics for our distributed programming language, which I'll show you briefly. It's not directly tied to TLA, but you know, it's like writing a spec of the language, and we all agree that writing specs is useful, and it helped us you know, um, make sure we, we dealt consistently with sort of uh, corner cases in, in the semantics, or more complicated cases. And then we've also done some work on translating from distalgo to TLA+. Um, in some of the proofs, uh, we did actual just manual translation because we can still get more concise and easier to work with um, translations that way. But we've also been working on improving the automated translations so that they're you know, uh, more manageable. Um, and one of the sort of themes we want to uh, uh, emphasize is that invariants are really useful when you're talking about distributed algorithms, both for making the specifications clearer, for guiding optimizations, uh, and finding improvements to the algorithms, and making the proofs easier. And the invariants that we uh, use the most are what we call high-level queries over history variables. In particular, the history variables we're we, we use are just the, C the sets of messages that have been sent and received by each process. Um, in general, history variables can be other things, but that's this particularly what we mean uh, by them and we use the most. And by high-level queries, I mean usually quantifications where you say, you know, for all messages that I've sent or received uh, as appropriate, you know, this property holds or there exists a message I received such that blah, 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 right? So quantifiers are, are sort of largely what I mean by high-level queries. Um, I mean, we allow quantifiers in them. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, introduce, like I said, the mutual exclusion algorithm that I'll use as a running example. 
Lamport developed it to, uh, as a sort of case study in the use of the logical clocks um, that he uh, met, proposed in the same paper. Uh, so there's a bunch of processes that want to access a shared resource, and they do that by requesting access to the shared resource. And then they, when it's been granted, they can go in the critical section. And there's a requirement that requests should be granted in the order in which they are made. And the general idea is that the timestamps from the logical clock determine, define the order in which the requests are made. Um, so that's the, the connection there. A process that wants to enter the critical section sends a request to all of the other processes, waits for replies, when it's gotten replies, it enters a critical section, and when it's done, it sends releases. That's the top-level structure. Uh, each process maintains a queue of requests ordered by the logical timestamps, and it enters the critical section only if its request is the first on the queue, meaning it's sort of the one with the lowest timestamp you know, um, that hasn't been granted yet. When it receives a request, it enqueues it, and when it receives a release, it dequeues the corresponding request. That's the general idea of how the algorithm works. It's not the most efficient you know, distributed mutual exclusion algorithm, but it's a good as a, as a sort of a case study in illustrating the concepts. Okay, and it assumes that um, communication is reliable in FIFO. Um, so you, this is a very classic algorithm. You can find lots of uh, pre presentations of it in different distributed algorithm textbooks and so on. Um, but again, you tend to find things that are sort of imprecise in English or, and, or maybe pseudocode, and then you know, sort of low-level things, which are like, for example, in Nancy Lynch's book, which we also saw this morning, it's a classic textbook in the field. She has about more than a, a page uh, to um, present this algorithm, and you'll see that our description of it is much more concise. And it's executable. And you know, IOT um, are kind of borderline in that regard. <laughs> there, there's some support for it, but it's not like a real programming language. Whereas our distalgo, um, uh, conceptually, it's some extensions that you could add to any programming language. But in practice, we have implemented them as extensions to Python. Okay. Um, so it's, it's part of a real programming language. Um, so uh, I described roughly the algorithm already. And here's just, so I won't go through this in too much detail, but it just, uh, again, says the same kind of thing, like when you want to request a resource, you send a request message with a timestamp and your process ID to every other process and put it on your queue. When you receive a, uh, a, a request message, you put it on your queue and then send an acknowledgment back to the requester. To when you, if you already are in the critical section, you want to release the resource, you send, um, you, you remove the pending request from your queue and then send a release message to everyone else. Um, when, it, when you, a process receives a release message, it removes that corresponding request from the queue. And this is the sort of key part of the algorithm. When do you get, under what condition can you enter the critical section? And these are the two uh, conditions. And I get, uh, by original description, I mean we basically just copied this right out of this paper. Okay. Um, so first, you can uh, enter the critical section when there's a, you have a pending request okay, in your queue, which is ordered before. Uh, all the other requests by the less than relation, which is, uh, um, is ordered by logical time, but with the process ID as a tiebreaker, because two processes could use the same uh, logical timestamp on their requests. So you have to have, your request has to be first, so to speak, and you have to have received an acknowledgement message from every other process that is a timestamp later than your request, okay? Because they're supposed to acknowledge it when they receive your request. You need to make sure they did that. So those are the uh, two conditions. Um, so you know, translating this into this algo isn't uh, completely straightforward. And making it executable, you have to say something about how do you create processes, how do they find each other, blah, blah, blah. And you'll see that in this algo, we can do all that in a very high level um, and uh, succinct fashion. Whereas if you did this in like Java, you would be writing you know, probably five times as much code to accomplish the same thing. So um, here's the key uh, constructs in this algo. We have. Um, so similar to a class declaration, we have process declarations, and processes are objects. This is really just like a class declaration, except it can have some additional constructs in it for, for handling messages. Um, we have this send statement is pretty conventional. You can send a message or a set of messages to a process or a set of processes. Uh, for control flows, one of the key things in concurrent, including distributed algorithms, is atomicity. So, at what points in your local control flow can you stop and handle messages? And so we have a note that we call that a yield point, and you can end it, there's automatically a yield point at an await statement because it's explicitly a synchronization construct, and you can add yield points at other places by using this special syntax dash dash 
uh, and then a name for the yield point, which is kind of optional. Um, receive uh, m from p is, uh, we call this a receive handler. And these are, you can think of them sort of like method declarations. They're, they're things that appear at a top level in a process class definition. And this says if you receive a message m from process p, then execute the following statement. Um, and these can be executed again wherever, whenever the sort of main control flow is at a yield point. Uh, await is our main synchronization statement. Uh, and you wait for some condition uh, and then execute the corresponding statement. There can be a bunch of branches, and you can also have a timeout, again, with a corresponding statement. Um, so the way, now, uh, the condition, of course, only refers to local variables of this process. But the reason this is tied into distributed algorithms is the variables you often use here are the sets of messages sent and received, OK, uh, as I mentioned before. And also, the, the, these conditions often involve what I mentioned, these high-level queries, which can have quantifiers. We write some for existential quantifier and each for universal quantifier. And these are just the usual kind of bindings. This variable ranges over that set. And we write has, meaning it like satisfies, or such that this condition holds. And as a syn just syntactic sugar, you can write received m as a shorthand for m in received. All oh, right, that was the other thing I wanted to say. I knew I forgot something. Is as you'll see, we can use pattern matching as well. You know, like if you may be familiar with like OCaml or something. Um, so what you can have here, not just a single variable like m, you can have a, pa a pattern there, and then pieces of the components of the message get matched and bound to the corresponding pieces of the pattern. That's very convenient. And you, um, new, new piece creates an instance of process p, uh, and then you, you can, there's something called setup, which is like a constructor roughly, and then start, which like in you know, most many threading packages actually lets the process start running. Okay. So here's, uh, I, I'm sorry that the font is not very big. I hope you can uh, read it, or at least some of it. But this is what the original algorithm, just translating it most straightforward way into this algo looks like. And the comments show you which parts correspond to which rules. And remember, the IO automata was like more than one page. And you see this is a little fragment of a page. And we have an even simpler version, which I might show you later if there's time. Uh, so uh, the, the comments show which parts directly encode rules uh, from the, the you know, uh, that were labeled here, right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They correspond directly to pieces of this program. The mo so for example, just, uh, so here's an example of a receive handler. And here's, you know, using pattern matching. So I received a request message with timestamp T2 from process P2. And I add something to my queue, and I send an acknowledgment, right? Um, handling release message, you to delete something from the queue. Now, the, the sort of key thing, again, in, from step five was this uh, condition. And so it says, uh, for each request in the queue uh, that's not your own request, your request has to be ordered lower than that one. And for each um, other process, S is the set of other processes that was uh, passed to you and set up, you have to have received some acknowledgment from them whose timestamp is greater than your request. All right, so this is a very direct the point I want to convey is a very direct you know, uh, transla uh, translation of the, the sort of condition we stated before in very high level. Okay. All right, any question? Again, I know I'm going kind of fast, but I hope you're getting the, the, the ideas are coming across. And then to make this a complete executable program, there's just a little bit more stuff, like you create a bunch of processes, you set them up. For each process, you set up uh, past this, all the processes except itself, and then you call start. This starts this whole set of processes. Now, what I'm showing you here is what we call our ideal syntax. We have a slightly different syntax when you actually use this in Python, uh, just to make the, the parsing easier. But it, it's pretty similar. Um, so I, I won't go into the differences. It, uh, um, like I mentioned, uh, we have written uh, a formal operational semantics for it, which is, a, uh, again, we found this useful as a kind of a spec of the language to make sure we all knew what it means. Uh, it's a reduction semantics for the valuation context. It has, um, it's not quite the entire language. Like, I don't, obviously, we don't put all of Python in, but we have the sort of basic imperative constructs and plus R extensions, and in, including the, you know, the quantifications the, um, and the tuple, uh, the pattern matching, and so on, because uh, as well as the uh, receive handlers and the stuff that's sort of more explicitly distributed. Because those are all of our extensions. Um, and again, I don't want to uh, spend, uh, we, we haven't formalized the operational semantics in, in a, in a uh, system like you know, TLA, although that would be an interesting thing to do. Um, but right now, it's just uh, on, on paper. 
Um, so the state of the system is the local state for each process, plus just, just a, the, roughly the structure of it. I'm not really going to go into details. Um, but, and then um, the contents of the message channels, right? These are the, it's an asynchronous distributed system model, so there's the messages in transit. The local state of a process is basically a heap, and then um, uh, a statement remaining to be executed. So basically, initially, that's the body of the run method of the process. And then as things get executed, you sort of remove them uh, from, from that statement. Um, an evaluation context is used to identify the piece of that remaining statement that should be evaluated next. A transition updates that statement. For example, <coughs> for a sequential composition, it throws away the part that it just executed. If you're up to a loop, you unroll it in preparation for then uh, executing the first iteration. Or you can inline a method call. So that's how we deal, give semantics to method calls, just by inlining and substitution. In semantics, you can do that. <laughs> you don't want to implement it that way. but. Um, and then it updates also if, if uh, the executed part of the statement updates the local heap or, the, or sends messages or receives messages, whatever, you update the, the contents of those things. And an execution is then just a sequence of transitions starting from initial state. Um, this basically shows, uh, if you haven't seen this idea of evaluation context before, it might seem a little tricky. But the idea is that you put, this thing is called the whole, and you put it at the part of the um, expression that should be evaluated next. Like basically this structure here encapsulates the idea of left to right evaluation order. It says if all the things to the left uh, uh, in the tuple expression have already been uh, reduced to values, then the next thing to evaluate is the next expression, roughly, that's, that's not a value. And this says you have to evaluate the target object before you evaluate the uh, arguments and, and so on. I, I won't go through the details. Um, so we have a kind of standard transition relation. The structure of our global states is we have a map from uh, processes are just objects like other objects, you know, like they are in Python and Java and so on. Um, so we have a map from process addresses to their remaining statement. That's how we keep track of the control structure. Uh, a heap, which is a map from addresses to object contents. A heap type map, which keeps track of the type of the object at each address. That might not be strictly necessary, but it, it helps. Us. Um, the contents of the message channels and what we call the uh, contents of what we call the message queues, which these are the messages that have arrived at process and are waiting to be handled. And so they'll be handled at the next yield point. Right? That's the idea. Um, so the idea, uh, the way the context, the execution context, which I just showed you, get used in the operational semantics is in this kind of elegant context uh, rule. It says that if the process whose address is A uh, is waiting to execute statement S, and if it can do that, updating it to S prime, uh, and you know, updating everything else is appropriate, then if you, you can wrap any other context around that statement and just carry it along unchanged and let the rest of this transition happen. Right? And the reason you can do that is because this part here in the whole is the thing you should, about, you should execute next. Right? Um, I'm just going to show you one more transition rule and then we'll move on. Uh, this is the one that for handling messages. And so again, I know this will be really hard to read, so I'm just going to try to give you the, the sort of intuition, not go over in complete detail. But this says, if you're waiting, if you're at a yield point L, and the remaining statement is S, and this is process A. So this is my notation. It's kind of like pattern matching to say, you know, P is a function that maps A to this, and then maps other things to whatever, OK? Um, then you can take a transition where process A now has to execute statement S prime before it does this other stuff it was waiting to do. And S prime is basically the bodies of the receive handlers that match the message that you're uh, handling here. Okay, so that comes down here where this is like an auxiliary, this is an auxiliary function that matches this message against the receive handlers, sees which patterns match, takes their bodies, and puts them into a set S. And then this S prime is just a linearization of those uh, um, receive handler bodies in some order. And this is supposed to reflect that we wanted to say it's non-deterministic, the order of the receive handlers. They don't have to be like executed from top to bottom. Although, you know, and one of the reasons we decided to leave this kind of uh, non-determinism in the semantics is to allow for optimizations. You know, you, you may argue, well, why don't you just be deterministic? But anyway, this was our uh, choice. Okay, so I, I won't go through that in more detail. Um, and then this one I'll just skip. So now we'll move on to the part that is you know, sort of a little bit more directly related to TLA, um, which is uh, the, the formal verification. Uh, so we, um, we did some work where we, manu in some of our work, uh, we manually, we, we just started by writing specifications um, in TLA plus. 
we didn't really, uh, and we did that for p basic Paxos, which uh, makes, does a single round of consensus. They did it a set of processes agree on a single value. Multi Paxos is a kind of extension of, uh, of that, of the basic Paxos, which, agree, which will con agree on a sort of continuous sequence of values, right, as they get proposed. Fast Paxos, which is some optimized version of Paxos that tries to use fewer rounds of communication, and vertical Paxos, um, which, uh, anyway, the, uh, the difference doesn't uh, matter that much. It'll, it has to do with more efficient reconfiguration. Uh, so we model check those using TLC. And then we have, um, we, we used TLAPS for multi Paxos, and then a, a slightly more efficient version of it, which has uh, multi, called multi Paxos with preemption. Preemption basically means that if you see that a uh, proposed value will fail because someone else has made a larger timestamp proposal, then you should give up on trying to uh, your proposal and, and either wait for the other one to succeed or start over um, instead of trying to continue with something that will um, not succeed. Uh, we have also, um, we have the, so this uh, part is called manual translation because this means that we developed like the versions of algorithms in this algo and then manually translated them to, uh, to TLA, TLA plus for verification. Um, for the work with <coughs> TLC, we also did uh, implemented an automatic translator, which we had a couple of different versions using different uh, designs for the front end. Currently, what we do is <coughs> we use the Python parser to parse the program because it just we add the extensions in it to Python in a way where the distalgo program is still a syntactically legal Python program, but it doesn't quite mean what it looks like. Like we take like certain function calls and we actually they actually like for example await will actually appear to the Python parser as just a function call, but we actually interpret it as that synchronization statement, okay? So the Python parser parses it, but then we modify the AST that it produces to make our constructs sort of first class objects in the AST, and then we either do cogeneration or translation to um, TLA plus or you know, whatever we want to do with it. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I can mention that later. Uh, so here are some results from uh, the, uh, using TLAPS. So we, had, we did the first complete formal specification of multi-Paxos and TLA+. Plus. Stefan had done one of, of basic pack, what I call basic Paxos, which we used as a starting point. <coughs> and one of our, our strategies, because that was you know, a nice, elegant uh, specification, we decided that we would try to uh, follow its structure as closely as possible in our specification of multi-Paxos and make minimal changes to it, which is basically requires adding slot numbers so that you get a sequence of, value, um, of decisions instead of a single decision. But it's actually a little more complicated than just having a sequence number because you have to accumulate sets of proposals um, as you go. Um, so you have sets and sequences involved now instead of just a single value. And like we were, uh, the previous speaker just mentioned, once you have like sets and sequences around, it, it's just a lot, the, the, the reasoning just becomes a lot harder. There's just a lot more statements uh, you have to make. <coughs> um, okay, and, uh, and we also extended this with uh, preemption. And again, we, we tried to do that in a way that was as modular as possible with as little changes to the existing proof. Um, so here's just, uh, an illustrative example of uh, how the algorithm changed when you go from basic Paxos to multi Paxos. So here you have, you're sending a message where one of the components is just a single value, which you read out of some other message you received. Um, and instead, now what you have here is this uh, set of proposed slot numbers and values. Um, and so now this is a set of pairs instead of just a single value. That's the, the kind of change that happens as far as the type. And uh, similarly, where you're just keeping track of like a single, um, the maximum val ballot you voted for uh, here in this variable, now you have a set of, um, basically a set of proposals you've voted for. So, um, so a lot of the structure is the same except for this, this uh, type of change. Uh, we did, you know, a, kind of a standard proof uh, by induction. And the specification is a disjunction of the possible actions in Paxos. It's basically a two-phase algorithm. So there's sort of the outgoing part of phase one, and then the acknowledgment part, and the outgoing part of phase two, and then the acknowledgment. And for each of those, we have to show that, the, that each of the actions that define these phases, like I showed you phase 2b on the previous slide, uh, preserves all of the invariants. So we have a typo k invariant as usual. 
And then we <coughs> um, classify the remaining invariants as process invariants and message invariants. And what we mean by that is these are the ones that just talk about send and receive, and this is everything else. Okay. Um, So again, we, as I mentioned before, we try to emphasize having the proofs be as uh, concise as, and, and hopefully also as understandable as possible. So, <clears throat> so uh, the, the proof for basic Paxos, the specification, well, the specification was 52 lines and the proof 300, you know, sort of roughly 300 lines. For multi-Paxos, that increased to 78, which is, you know, considering the algorithm is considerably more complicated, significantly more complicated, this is a relatively modest increase. And the proof is a little under a thousand lines, which is again a significant increase because of the use of you know sets and se sets of tuples, um, and the the proof check time is, is around two minutes. Uh, when we added this extra feature of preemption, the uh, which again uh, adds it an extra message type and response saying hey give up on that proposal you know basically, um, so the algorithm is slightly longer and the proof is a little bit longer. Um, and, but actually the proof check time is a little bit faster because this helps sort of short circuit some of the uninteresting cases. So that was kind of an interesting um, side effect. Are you able to use the proof of basic Paxos to speed up the proof of Paxos? No, I mean, no, not, not in a formal way. We use it as a starting point and modify it so it saves us time in developing the proof, but there's no like caching and reuse of like within the prover or something. It's, yeah. it's not, yeah, that modular. Um, okay, so now I'm going to move on to the sort of this, a, a separate, uh, well, related but separate piece of work we did using where we wanted, we wanted to try to make our um, specifications uh, and proofs even simpler uh, and by emphasizing the use of what I, again, what I've been calling history variables, which are the ones just talk about the sent and received uh, sets. Uh, and we advocate this as a style of writing distributed algorithms, which is as much as possible, you should write the descriptions directly in terms of the set of messages using queries over them and get rid of all the other variables, uh, again, to the extent possible. Because often those other variables are simply derived, right, uh, um, quantities that can always be recomputed from the set of messages. And if they're only used in a limited number of places in the algorithm, it's actually easier just to sort of basically put the definition in there than to define this variable and then have to update that, you know, the value, the value of this derived quantity at each place where it's affected by, you know, sending or receiving a message. All those uh, updates, you know, make the spec more complicated uh, and longer. Uh, so, uh, and to show the benefits of this style of writing distributed algorithms, we, we applied it to basic Paxos, multi-Paxos, and the multi-Paxos preemption, which I've just, uh, just uh, met, described. Um, so, yeah, I, like I said, we, we classify all variables as history variables, which we just mean the ones over sent and received sets, and then derived variables, which are everything else. Um, and the derived variables are functions of history variables, and the local updates to those uh, derived variables are like derivatives of the expression defining the derived variable with respect to the changes to the um, with respect to the, the the changes which are basically sending and receiving messages. So <coughs> remember, I showed you this uh, phase two B uh, before. So here's an example of how it changes if we apply this methodology and say, remember, I, I mentioned we keep track of some uh, there's some derived variables here like the maximum um, ballot that you voted for, and, and, the, and max ballot is the value that was in that ballot, okay? And these are, that in the original spec, as, you know, Lamport et al. wrote it, he, they use these derived variables. Suppose we decide to rewrite the spec to get rid of them, okay? Uh, so, um, and, and we have to re now replace this with some expression that has the same meaning. So you can, we basically just refine the maximum ballot, right? So this says, uh, that you voted for. So we look for a sent message, which is of type 1B or 2B, those correspond to the phase of the algorithm. It's like voting for that, where the accept, where you sent the message, um, because this is a global sent set, uh, it's just easier to write this back that way. So you look for a message that you sent, and um, this, the ballot in this message has to be bigger than all the other ones, right? And now if I just directly use that definition, I don't have to maintain what was the maximum value of the ballot I voted for is a separate variable. And now this makes the specification simpler, right? Because I can throw this part away. I don't have to update that value each time I vote for something, right? Um, and so here's an example where I, I took the specification of this action and made it like 25% shorter. 
And, and this kind of thing happens uh, in, in many places in the algorithm. And we also, besides making the spec shorter, we also find we need fewer invariants in the proof. And in fact, we can uh, systematically, uh, you know, manually, but you know, in a systematic way, I'm not saying this is like automated, uh, derive the, the necessary message invariants, or at least most of them. Um, because a lot of them have a very a kind of simple and similar structure. The one we can't derive is a, a uniqueness invariant, which says that you don't make two proposals uh, with the same slot and different values. Okay. That doesn't fall into this really the, quite the same uh, paradigm. Uh, so uh, here's, a, a, to, to, il to keep this uh, um, illustration of this um, approach for just deriving the message invariant simple, I didn't uh, use Paxos for it, but used another, um, the mutex uh, example. So, but, um, so the main thing is most of the actions have this kind of structure where if there's a certain message in the sent sequence, then you send a, a related message as a response. And so the fields of the sent message are, are often copied or, or some simple functions of the, the corresponding message um, that someone else sent that you're responding to. And the idea is simply to take that relationship, so you see like this is the message that you found that was sent and that you've received, uh, to, to just notice how its attributes are used to define the attributes of the message you're sending, and then just capture that as an invariant. So now the corresponding invariant for that action that we would obtain in a kind of uh, systematic way is just so for every ma ACK message, there's, um, there's a corresponding message that satisfies the property you know, its type is request, and then these relations hold between the attributes of the sent and received messages. Um, so now here's the uh, benefits of, of this uh, approach. So in this, so I mentioned before, like the original specification of basic Paxos um, that Stefan and, and Lamport and so on um, had derived, uh, written was 52 lines, and by eliminating derived variables, it decreases by 25% to 39 lines. Uh, the proof size uh, shrinks by a similar amount, and the number of invariants we need is all to write to help the prover is also considerably smaller. Uh, for multi-paxos, we get, again, like quite large uh, reductions in, in both the size of the spec and the proof, and, um, and those are maintained when we uh, add the preemption and, and decrease in the you know, number of invariants. Okay. Uh, now let me talk, uh, we haven't done as much with TLC, but let me briefly mention what we did. Uh, so we, um, we uh, checked, you know, we ran it on small numbers of processes, um, and uh, one, we, we compared uh, running, so the, the main, I guess, uh, uh, part of this slide that I haven't sort of mentioned before already, is that um, we can, we, if we ran TLC, on the original ver handwritten versions of the spec for um, of these algorithms, say distributed mutual exclusion algorithm, uh, and we compared it, we took that as kind of a benchmark. Like the, 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 these are sort of well-written specs, and we'll try to uh, do make create automatic translations that are as good as those. Um, and our, our first uh, simple translation would create um, specs that, when you ran TLC on them, the number of states was like an order of magnitude larger. Right, um, because there's just lots of inner sort of junk that you don't really need for this specific algorithm, but in general you might need it, right? So you so it goes in there as states and tra uh, variables and transitions, and we've um, by improving this, you know, uh, and adding some kind of sort of like compiler optimizations that get rid of dead code, dead state components, and try to use larger atomicity and so on. We now uh, the number of um, uh, states that are generated when you run TLC on R, manual, or automatically translated TLA plus translated from this algo is now within a, you know, a factor of two or less of the, uh, what you get by running it on the handwritten version. So this is, reflects quite a bit of progress and we're trying to you know, make it even better. Um, so this summary is, this is just the same as the slide I <coughs> showed you before. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I won't go through it again. Um, it's not quite the end, though. So I just wanted to em uh, emphasize the, the benefits of uh, invariance in distributed algorithms. And um, by invariance, I, I include, uh, you know, as you write the algorithm, to some extent, the, the uh, queries in the 
over the sent and received. We think of those, those are like invariants um, in, a, in, a, in a sense about the state of the system and how it uh, relates to the, the next action to take. Um, now, one of the, now you might be saying, well, this Dalgo is executable, right? So you want to be able to run this program and have it you know, behave reasonably. But if you write everything in terms of queries over sent and received, it's like you're shooting yourself in the foot, right? That's going to be really expensive. You're going to have this you know, unending amount of state accumulating, and you're going to have to evaluate these expensive uh, quantified expressions. So our answer to that is, you know, um, we want th that's a compiler's job to make that efficient, right? Our focus is on l making the, the sort of developer's job as easy as possible, right? Let them write simple, short, high-level things, and then we'll let the compiler, you know, sort of do as much of the work as, po uh, uh, as possible of introducing derived variables um, and then uh, using an incrementally and efficiently maintaining those instead of always repeating those queries. And we have done quite a bit of work before this um, on, on exactly that. We call that incrementalization, uh, replacing expensive queries with incrementally uh, maintained uh, results that we, we introduce into the program. Um, and you know, so an in, uh, invariants also help you uh, discover improvements to the algorithms, at least we've found that to be the case. And, um, uh, allow easier proofs. Um, so just as an example, and I'm not going to go through all of this because uh, uh, I'm almost out of time, but uh, I mentioned uh, that we, uh, uh, simplification of algorithms. So we found a number of ways in which the original description, which I showed you before, of mutex can be uh, simplified. For example, in steps one and three, you don't actually need to enqueue and dequeue your own request. If you just send yourself the request and release messages and handle them the same way as you do as the messages from everyone else, it'll just work right. So you don't have to put that into the program explicitly. Um, we, uh, um, so, so these, um, the, you can optimize the, uh, so this isn't really a simplification, but an optimization, you can use a, 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 an incrementally maintained a queue for finding the earliest request to compare yours with. Um, another thing we noticed then is that you don't actually have to compare your um, uh, own request uh, with um, the, the, the one you, your, uh, any previous request from yourself with your own request, because um, you only have to compare it with the request from other processes. Um, you can actually uh, reduce the amount of state that's maintained by just keeping a count of requests whose timestamp is smaller than yours, um, uh, instead of actually keeping track of all of uh, of that set of requests explicitly. And you, you can, um, in the theme of you know, rewriting everything to use just sent and received, in fact, you don't even need to maintain a queue at all. With a simple query over the message history, you can figure out which requests are still pending. These are basically just the requests for which you haven't received a corresponding um, uh, release yet. And so if you, uh, you can simplify the algorithm by getting rid of the queue completely, and now you get whoops, um, this description. And you see how short it is, right? <laughs> Which is really kind of amazing that the algorithm can be uh, made this concise. And this just says, right, so these are, now we've replaced, instead of using the queue here in the second edition, we just, we just check whether for each P2 you've received an ACK. Um, oh, sorry, it, the queue was used here. So uh, you just check whether uh, uh, you've received a release with a larger timestamp. Anyway, so... The, um, okay, let's see. There's some issue about fairness with, um, in the mutual exclusion algorithm. So there was a kind of informal statement of fairness in the, in the paper um, that requests should be granted in the order in which they're made. There is, um, we, the, um, but what, one thing that happens in this algorithm is all of the messages that are sent uh, update the logical clock, right? including the messages sent by the mutex algorithm itself. But from the application's point of view, those orderings are not really meaningful. right? The, and you know, you should, uh, it, it seems to make more sense to have a separate logical clock that only keeps, that's only affected by the application's actions and not by the actions of sort of the, let's say, the sort of infrastructure like your mutex, mutual exclusion algorithm. And this actually can affect the order this distinction about when the clocks get updated actually can affect the order in which requests will be serviced. And so that's sort of one of the ideas here about doing fairness in a, in a kind of uh, more meaningful or more appropriate way for the application. Um, 
we also have um, done some work, uh, which I didn't describe before, on uh, formalizing a more, uh, let's say, realistic version of Paxos called Paxos Made Moderately Complex, which was developed by Robert Van Rennes, who's a well-known distributed system researcher and one of his students. Um, and the spec is, uh, remember, we had like something like 39 lines, I think, or something for Paxos. Anyway, so this is a little bit longer, 50, but it includes some, uh, like again, some more um, uh, changes to the algorithm that make it more suitable for uh, real deployment. And we did find some errors in Van Rennes' uh, Van Rennes's, uh, spec. There was a liveness violation where if a certain pattern of message loss happens, in particular, if all of the proposals for a given slot are dropped, then actually the algorithm gets stuck because of the way they tried to optimize things and not like retry too much, right? Um, so, so we found that error um, as, we, as part of our formalization. Although I, have to, I should admit, we didn't approve liveness in TLAPS. So far, we've only done uh, the formal proofs are only safety. Uh, you know, maybe eventually we'll try to do liveness as well. It's certainly an important uh, property for these algorithms. OK, so uh, thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, I'll, any questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you, Scott. Uh,